So after first having the uh, climate change talks in the morning and then the uh, economic kind of ambiguity theory talks, we now have a session where people already brought the two together in some, uh, some applications, all of them in commonly uh, applied ambiguity models and related to uh, the precautionary principle. And yeah, please start, Marcello Basili. Oh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Uh, let me introduce uh, this, uh, our paper on uh, precautionary principle. Uh, we published this paper in uh, Ecological Economics, and we investigate uh, on decision-making process involving both risk and ambiguity. Uh, we start from um, a community prospect theory, all we know, uh, community prospect theory, Kahneman Tversky, uh, but uh, we introduce um, uh, some change in this approach that we will use uh, in our representation. Uh, CPT, uh, community prospect theory, say that people uh, can see a uh, different attitude with respect to ambiguity uh, when um, uh, face uh, uh, losses and gains. Um, that is, is a pessimist on uh, gains and an optimist uh, on losses. But uh, we start from a question, it is, a, is it possible to conceive a pessimism on uh, extreme losses and uh, optimism uh, on windfall gains? And uh, we consider at least uh, two sources of uh, support to support uh, this, uh, this idea. The first one is uh, evidence. There is uh, some papers that, uh, on the basis of uh, experimental uh, economics, uh, uh, show that uh, this behavior exists. The other one is based on inter uh, introspection and uh, anecdotal speeches. Uh, um, as I, I told, uh, a great deal of experimental literature on community prospect theory shows a positive correlation between the decision maker attitude and the nozzle size of the outcomes. Uh, what we introduce is a different uh, attitude with respect to familiar that is more related to ordinary life uh, events and extreme events. Uh, we are talking about climate change, and climate change is a, an extreme event that is uh, events that we consider probable with a, with a very, very low probability, but with, co with catastrophic consequences. Other examples are, for example, Katrina or hurricane, but also uh, attitude with respect to, uh, to pandemic flu, for example. That, uh, that event is... Uh, uh, extreme events, and we think that people have a different attitude with respect to this kind of event and with respect to more ordinary events, familiar events in some sense. Uh, and we think that there exists also a competence effect. Uh, in the previous uh, uh, presentations, uh, we, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, models in which the competence effect or uh, confidence, in some sense, we can term confident, named confidence or competence, exists in a representation, in axiomatic representation, and also in a representation. And uh, this is uh, particularly true in the behavioral economics and in behavioral finance, in which uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, phenomena that we can explain only if we assume a competence or confidence. Uh, aspect. For example, you have to consider that uh, people prefer to invest uh, on familiar uh, asset. For example, the, the asset of the firm in which uh, they, work, they work, or for in the case of Italy, even if you have a bad news about this, uh, this firm, such as a Chile, or a very famous, or uh, uh, other, or uh, a Parmalat, you, you continue to invest. Um, there is a, with respect to uh, an adept or, uh, or introspection, we refer to Daniel Ellsberg uh, that referred this, uh, uh, this, uh, this effect when he was a uh, uh, consultant to the Fen department. Uh, and this, uh, this, uh, this effect is reported in the Pentagon's paper. Uh, when we talk about uh, the, this uh, real situation in which the Mr. the President of the United States had to decide if to uh, introduce or to start the production of uh, intercontinental uh, 
uh, ballistic missiles uh, with multiple uh, heads in, uh, as a, uh, a reaction to muscle by the Soviet Union. And uh, Ellsberg, also in a, in a, a private conversation, reported that there was a, a lot of um, estimation about what is the, the real number of, uh, of missiles in, in the Soviet Union. And there was a, a large number uh, of uh, different uh, estimation. But uh, um, at the end, the presidents, uh, based on uh, his rule, decided to, to start this program. But uh, later, they discovered that uh, what is the, the real reason, or the reason that the president uh, Accept as, a, as a, the, the motivation to start this production was not true. In fact, the missile gap favoring the Soviet had been a fantasy. There was a gap, but it was currently 10 to 1 in the favor of the United States. Uh, and the, the, the 40 Atlas and Titan ICBM uh, were matched by only four Soviet missiles. Uh, so, in this case, we think that the president, this is a for answer of your question before, uh, how the uh, policy maker have to uh, behave when they have a different uh, estimation on different uh, uh, evaluation about possible uh, uh, events. Uh, we think that in this case, the role of uh, the decision maker is irrelevant. Also in the case of pandemic is irrelevant. And then you have to decide an entity or a behavior, decision rule that is uh, current and uh, consistent with your role. This is a, uh, uh, okay. Uh, we think that all this, uh, uh, this kind of behavior can be represented by Shoke Integral. Uh, and uh, in some sense, our approach is uh, uh, very similar with the uh, restricted by a service criterion proposed by Ellisberg in his dissertation and, uh, and published in 2001. Um, we uh, restrict attention to a specific attitude where ambiguity, the, the, uh, that is, the decision maker is symmetric with respect to risk, and their knowledge is fully ambiguous. It is possible to assume an intuitive representation of the decision-maker preference as a linear combination of the expected utility of an act and its most extreme outcomes. Um, this is a new uh, representation of the precautionary principle. Uh, we have also a development that we, we see at, uh, at the end of presentation. But in this case, uh, we considered we, in the, this morning, in the, we, we have a, a, a representation of the precautionary principle as a max mean that is uh, a very conservative. Huh? One of the most uh, critics to the precautionary principle is the fact that we always uh, are conservative. Uh, on the contrary, if we adopt uh, max max, we are dissipative. That is, we does not consider I don't, uh, he does not consider the possible consequence of the worst consequence. And in the Cernay view, for example, you have uh, an alpha male approach in which you have a convex combination between a dissipative and conservative approach based on max mean, alpha max mean, and uh, plus one minus alpha uh, max max. And in fact, uh, in the Cernay view, uh, Professor Ster referred to Henri to support this approach. And there is an axiomatization with Henri Henry in the uh, at, at beginning of 2000 uh, about this uh, the, the decision rule that uh, they implement in the Stern review. We have a different uh, uh, decision rule. We consider the extreme events, the extreme outcomes. But we, we, we think that uh, there is a large role for the intermediate uh, that is familiar outcome that in uh, a convex combination are lost. Um, okay, uh, as you know, we have uh, two uh, general uh, uh, formulation of uh, precautionary principle. One is a strong version based on the max mean approach, and the other one is a, a weak version. Um, the critics is 
that this um, approach based on a strong uh, version of a precautionary principle is very, very conservative. And there is also another version, a weak version, that uh, we can say that rests on the op option value. That is, uh, the, the, this, um, this version of a precautionary pr principle assumes that in evaluation of uh, an act, you have to introduce also the option value. Mm -hmm. So when you have a cost-benefit analysis, you have to introduce the opportunity cost induced by an irreversible and uh, uncertain choice. In fact, in Stern uh, review, we have this uh, convex combination between the max min and max max. Uh, we think that uh, the consequence, the main consequence of this approach, of uh, any approach that is a, a simply convex combination of uh, a max max and a max min uh, criterion, is the, uh, that uh, familiar events are undervalued. And on the contrary, extreme events uh, that is unfamiliar in our language are over-evaluated. So we propose uh, a decision rule that mitigates this effect. Um, so this is your, the, the decision maker as well defined risk and ambiguity attitude, the capacity we introduce, we are in, uh, in the context of multiple prior that we represent uh, as the core of, of the convex capacity. That is, uh, is a technical fact, but uh, we can assume that the decision maker is, uh, is a face, uh, faces uh, multiple prior. Uh, this decision maker, uh, the, the capacity is a strictly non-additive on unfamiliar events because of ambiguity attitude and the additive uh, on events related to a customary outcome. The decision maker perceives uh, genuine ambiguity with respect to unfamiliar losses and gain and is ambiguity neutral across the customary outcomes. So we uh, develop this integral. Uh, this is a uh, an integral in which we have uh, uh, unfamiliar, that is, extreme losses, in which we have losses that people consider um, familiar with respect to a reference point. Huh? Reference point can be uh, income, can be a, sit a real situation. Uh, these are these are uh, gains uh, that we consider familiar, and this one is uh, extreme gains. Uh, we say that the decision maker is a pessimistic with respect to losses if she overestimates catastrophic losses in the sense that her evaluation of a catastrophic losses in the first part of the integral is lower than the one she would capture through the additive uh, probability. Uh, we say that the decision maker, definition two, is optimistic with respect to gain if uh, she overestimates a windfall gain in the sense that the, her evaluation of a, fin of a windfall gain is higher than the one she will capture to the additive one. Moreover, we uh, assume that the decision maker uh, has a simple capacity. We consider a simple capacity that is, uh, 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 we represent this capacity as, a, as a, a distortion of a probability. So the decision maker is a pessimistic if, uh, if and only if the core of the, the conjugate capacity is non-empty and contains, this is a technical assessment, and contain, uh, contains pi, and the decision maker is optimistic if and only if the anti-core of uh, the capacity is non-empty and contain the probability. If uh, uh, this condition are uh, verified, we, we have that this theorem holds. Um, so, in the case of a simple capacity, we have this representation of the previous integral, in which we have uh, uh, the first part, in which we have uh, 
um, a parameter gamma that represents the confidence with respect to the assessment of the probability. And we have uh, this extreme event plus uh, uh, the, um, the, this parameter that is the confidence that uh, consider uh, that multiply uh, some part of the previous integral. Uh, this integral is, uh, is increasing in the, in the uh, extreme gains, the best windfall gain, and decreasing uh, in the worst uh, catastrophic losses. Uh, if the decision maker is a matrix with respect to risk, uh, that is, if they consider the, uh, the negative loss, the negative losses and the positive gains, the extreme negative losses uh, as equal in uh, an absolute value, then uh, an act X, an act X is, is metrically ambiguous, is this condition is verified. Uh, definition three means that the decision maker takes M and capital M and M as being equally bad and good in the sense that she takes the biggest familiar losses and the, the highest familiar gain as being equally distant from zero. Uh, we say also that uh, an act is uh, totally ambiguous is uh, this condition is verified. There is no familiar word uh, at all. And then we are in the, in the standard case of a community prospect here. Um, now, if uh, definition three, four, and, and five old, the Choquet integral uh, becomes very, very simple to represent. And we have that uh, the, uh, the Choquet integral of, uh, of this act is uh, given by this uh, Combination, convex combination between the extreme, the two extreme events, that is the, the, the worst uh, losses, loss and uh, the, the windfall gain, plus uh, the expected value of the familiar outcomes. That in this case, the decision maker represents belief according to a linear combination of the uh, of his expectation outcomes over all gains and losses, and the best worst one. She uh, Balanches the best windfall gains and the worst catastrophic losses that she is going to bear for a given degree of confidence, that is this parameter, she is more willing to undertake an act that might lead to truly unusual consequences. The former is bigger than the latter and vice versa. Uh, what is the, the conclusion of this part is the many decision problems, simple and dual simple capacities, provide an intuitive and easily tratable framework that can be sufficient to, to express decision maker attitude toward ambiguity. Whenever one can clearly distinguish between ambiguity and risk attitude and identify the role that both subjective evaluation of outcomes and belief play in assessing the decision maker behavior. Um, Recent development of this approach uh, is based on a uh, uh, recent paper of uh, Basilian Chateauneuf uh, that introduced uh, a quantile representation in a setting with a general ambiguity averse decision maker that has multiple prior possible events. Uh, we introduce a, a couple of quantiles and then we define uh, again a familiar and unfamiliar event with respect to, uh, to an interval of probability. Uh, we consider sigma algebra standard assumption, and we have uh, uh, a very, very interesting uh, um, representation because uh, we focus uh, on a particular probability in the case of a familiar event that is a uh, very, very interesting probability. Uh, it is the, the probability that maximizes uh, the entropy. Uh, which can be considered and the less diffuse, and uh, which is a nun to dominate any other probability distribution in the core of uh, the capacity for Lorentz ordering. It is a very, very interesting uh, probability. Moreover, because of ambiguity information, the decision maker disentangled the problem of assessing uh, the which kind of probability you have to use for familiar event. The answer is the probability that maximizes uh, entropy. And so 
we uh, obtain uh, a very, very interesting representation. In fact, uh, we, we can enlarge and restrict the tail of uh, the cumulative probability distribution, and we obtain a platycurtic negative skewed function. That is, we, we give, in the case of application of precautionary principle, more ways to the, the negative part of the distribution. That is, the detail that we consider as related to losses. Um, what is the conclusion? Uh, we have a, a, a new notion of the precautionary principle that is not a simple convex combination between the standard max mean and max mass approach that is a conservative and dissipative arc or alpha male approach, but it is a combination between the two most extreme evaluation or events and the mathematical expectation in the first case and in the second case, uh, in the recent development, the mathematical expectation with respect to the probability that maximizes entropy on the possible res results attached to each act in the ordinary events. That is all. I'm also going to talk about the precautionary principle, and as we've already heard, I guess there's lots of different, uh, lots of different interpretations trying to get it, um, uh, trying to get it an intuition which seems appealing, but but has proved uh, startlingly hard to formalise. And that's also true, I guess, of another one of my uh, research interests, uh, which, which is unawareness. That is, uh, uh, in the famous phrase of Donald Rumsfeld, "Unknown unknowns." What should we? What should we do? How should we reason about the fact that our reasoning capacity is limited? So um, I suppose uh, going for double or nothing, I'm going to attempt to uh, uh, cover both these topics and, and see whether, whether tying them together makes, uh, makes either of them any easier. So a few things. For, so start with, um, start with a summary of the program, which is, um, is that uh, Decision analysis is always incomplete, and I'm going to um, going to put this in a sort of uh, ontological sense as well. That, that we, we look at the history of of decision theory, and we see more and more rich models trying to add in more and more things, but still remaining incomplete in a formal sense. Uh, in ever more sophisticated theories, uh, but also I think an inherent incompleteness associated with bounded rationality that we, we're still just coming to grips with. So looking at uh, a, a very brief potted history of the development of risk analysis models, a bunch of this history I've sort of lived through, so, so I, I know it. Uh, some of it obviously predates uh, anybody here. So we start by thinking we've got a problem with uncertainty. What do we do about it? Well, the simplest case, and, and probably if you believe Kahneman and Tversky, the standard approach is pick the representative case, what you think of as the average climate or planet or family, uh, analyse how the, as best you can, how the problem works for that case, and act as if that was all you needed to know. And, uh, and certainly so, lots of social policy starts with the couple with two kids. If the model works, uh, works in that case, then um, uh, we go ahead and implement it, and we don't worry too much about anything else. Well, uh, statistics you know, uh, from an early age gives us at least something which is mostly better than that, which is to use mean values rather than simply picking out a representative, typically a modal value. Not always better. You know, policy for the family with 2.2 kids may not always be uh, better than policy for the family with two kids, but uh, in, general, uh, in general, it's a step forward to think about probabilities, uh, try and work out what our mean return is rather than to, um, rather than to simply uh, optimise for what seems like the most likely case. And already, if we think about uh, if we think about climate change or and typical environmental problems, uh, this is going to be uh, uh, going to lead to a big change towards precautionary thinking. That is, uh, and I'll be using this this uh, stylized fact a lot. The kind of problems we're talking about are mostly problems where surprises are unpleasant. We don't often you know, take a drug and find that it has lots of favourable side effects we hadn't thought about. Uh, that does happen, but, but mostly the case is the opposite. We don't often intervene in the environment and find out things we didn't know. So if we have a large sample, 
uh, the, mean, yeah, the mean calculation is going to include some of those bad outcomes. That's going to give us a more realistic thing than if we simply say, take a project, let the project's proponents describe the most likely case, the one when everything works, and then evaluate it on that basis. Uh, that's uh, okay, but again, you know, we, we still haven't really got to grips with a lot of fairly basic intuitions about risk, and so the next step forward is, is to bring in uh, higher moments. Typically, it turns out that once you've got the variance, you've got most of what you can out of a moments-based approach. Uh, taking account of the variance is certainly a big step forward in thinking about how to make decisions. Uh, the same mean with a high variance is, is a lot less appealing, typically, than, um, uh, than with a low variance. Uh, then a big step in terms of, um, in terms of a big conceptual advance, I think, uh, when we move to expected utility theory. We've gone from a bunch of heuristics to something which can be axiomatically justified with appealing examples. Of course, we can work back and, and axiomatically justify these other models if we feel like it, but the great thing about expected utility, well, the many great things about it, as a critic of expected utility, I'll take a moment to say how, how great it is. It, it, it has appealing normative axioms. It integrates, if you buy the whole story, uh, choice under uncertainty, choice over time, allocation between individuals if you're a utilitarian. Uh, all of these things should flow out of a single expected utility model with a very appealing axiomatic characterization, and one which in this context leads us again to, uh, to be more concerned about, uh, about adverse risks than we would be um, uh, typically with a deterministic analysis and, and usually, you know, usually with a mean variance analysis because you typically expect the utility analysis automatically takes, takes into account uh, fat tails and things like that that variance effects, uh, variance analyses handle badly. Uh, in this context, not a logical step forward, but something important is that, um, is that uh, when we try and consider uh, actions we, we might take, uh, yeah, logically this was always in the expected utility framework, but until I guess Ken Arrow and a couple of other people um, I came along, we didn't think that much about it, that if we wait, we get information. Uh, if we haven't made an irreversible decision in the, in the meantime, we can get some option value. So there was a long period of confusion, I guess, when option value was seen as this sort of separate category, but it's just part, it's just part of the dynamic interpretation of expected utility. And this is certainly a popular and I think reasonable, uh, reasonable view for the precautionary principle, but my imaginary Bayesian uh, Opponent is going to say, well, sure, I always, always knew that. Thanks for pointing it out. We don't need a precautionary principle to tell us we should do our expected utility right rather than doing it wrong, um, which is all that option value is, is, is telling us. So now we move on to the kinds of things we've been talking about, um, uh, kinds of things we've been talking about uh, here. Uh, Generalise expected utility with, uh, with given probabilities. Uh, I'm certainly going to put this dot point in because it's my claim to fame in this field, the, the rank dependent model, which is sort of gives the cumulative bit of cumulative prospect theory, deals with reasons why with known probabilities we might nonetheless want to put more weight on the extreme events in that known probability distribution than in the, the less extreme events. Uh, you can axiomatise that or you can regard it as a, re, as a reduced form of some of the higher level considerations I'm going to talk about and that have already been mentioned. Uh, Lots of reasons why we might feel that taking, uh, putting weight on the extreme events, having reduced things to a probability distribution is a good idea. Uh, uh, then finally we get to the point, well, where did these probabilities come from? Uh, you know, for a long while that the, the main approach was to just assume we had probabilities, obviously we typically don't, uh, and we moved to multiple priors type models, which again, if they're going to be tractable, typically lead you to a, um, uh, typically lead you to a more conservative position, a max min, at least over some set of probabilities, is, is the standard recommendation. So what we see is two things. One is we're adding stuff in all the time. The other is when we look back, we see that what we left out in this kind of domain, the kind of domain we're talking about, what we left out was going to lead us to overly optimistic decisions. Every time we add something in, it gives us another reason for being more cautious. So that's, I guess, my uh, general story of how this... Um, uh, you know, how, this, how the development of risk analysis has led us to a bunch of things, no one of which is uniquely the precautionary principle, but all of which, uh, all of which are pushing us in that direction. But I still think we need to, need to go further than that development uh, to fundamental incompleteness. All of, this, all of the stories I've been talking about 
fit naturally into a savage type of state act framework. We have a set of exogenously given states of nature. Uh, they're the things we can't affect. We can't affect the set and we can't affect the probability of any, the occurrence of any event in that state. Uh, and we can associate that with a set of propositions. Each, each state uh, is naturally associated in our language with a description. The ball, ball comes out red, the ball comes out black, and so forth. Um, my dot points have gone slightly. But in reality, we can never consider all the possible states. Um, our language you know, have, contains an effectively infinite number of propositions. Not, none of us, being finite beings, can formulate all those propositions, consider their implications, and so forth. Our analysis is always limited. Now, that's, um, if, if we stop there, that would just be a fact. We would just have the, we just have to do our best. But of course, it's much, I've just stated this fact, it's not, not only are we boundedly aware, we're aware of that fact. And if I could throw in a little dig at my behavior, behavioral colleagues, a lot of them, I think, are happy with the notion of bounded rationality, but tend to focus on tend to focus on examples of fairly unsophisticated thought, you know, optical, you know, the equivalent of optical illusions and so forth that people display. This is a fundamental fact about all of us, no matter how sophisticated, we can't consider all the possibilities. We can, on the other hand, talk about, uh, whether we'll see whether satisfactorily or not, the fact that we can't consider all the possibilities. And so we can uh, have a higher level of reasoning or a, a meta level of reasoning where we uh, think about the fact that no matter how clever we are, we can't think about all, all the possibilities. And so I'm going to argue that uh, this leads us to a viewpoint of a decision theory which is subject, uh, uh, decision theory, that is a formal deductive decision theory with a state space, which is subject to heuristic constraints. These constraints themselves can't be justified in terms of the, um, in terms of the deductive model. If they were, they'd be part of the model. Uh, and therefore I claim they have to be uh, justified inductively. And this leads us to a range of inductive principles of which you know, case-based decision theory is one. I'm not going in that direction here, but that's certainly one idea that is, is, is relevant. So I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to uh, just now work through an example of this kind. And, and this is a really simple example, and, and I just want to stress yeah, we shouldn't pay attention to this fact because yeah, we shouldn't think, oh, well, the decision maker could think about all the possibilities here. The whole point is, yeah, if we describe something that was too complicated for the decision maker to think about, I'd have to have a, um, a diagram too large for anybody to, to, to read in the time available. So I'm, I'm simplifying how simple the decision maker is without suggesting that the decision maker is in any way more boundedly rational than any, any of the rest of us. So there's nature in this story affects a project where the decision maker is considering whether to undertake a project uh, and they have, the decision maker also has a third option which is to undertake some study uh, before, they, uh, before they decide what to do. Uh, the idea here is that the decision maker is not aware of all the possibilities. So here's the general story. So nature moves first and decides whether, whether this is in, fact, in effect a high risk project or a low risk project. Uh, it goes up to here, this is the high hazard, uh, high hazard choice. Down to here is the low hazard choice. The little circle says the decision maker doesn't know about this, uh, doesn't know which choice it is. In fact, what we're going to see uh, in this story going beyond the standard game theoretic framework is that the decision maker isn't even aware of this move back here. So um, at this point, uh, and I assume the parameters are right, the decision maker can either undertake the study, which will lead them to reject because it's a high hazard uh, option in this case, and lead them to approve in the low study case, or they can just go ahead and approve and reject, uh, uh, approve or reject without further consideration. And I've got the little payoffs here with C, the cost of the study, M, the moderate damage, and S, the severe damage. And one is the payoff from the project. So that's the, uh, the external perspective. Now here's, my diagrammatic skills are not what they might be, but all I've done here is cut off, uh, cut off the first node of which the decision maker is unaware, and, uh, and the top tree, the decision makers are unaware of the possibility of the high hazard state in the sense that yeah, they don't have a model which includes it. So they look at it and they see, um, they see study and approve, that is when they, whenever they study in their story, they're, they look, they're forward looking, they don't know what the risks are, they'll approve um, and then there's a risk, they'll, yeah, in either of those cases there's a risk that they'll get moderate damage or they can reject and get zero. Uh, easy to see that study in this story is a dominated action. 
So they're going to choose between approve and, and reject. And since I've assumed that study leads to approve, approve is going to dominate reject. So in this story, the boundedly rational decision maker uh, hasn't considered any other possibilities but this one. They therefore don't study and approve. So now I'm going to introduce awareness of unawareness in a, a um, absolutely uh, as, as vague a fashion as I can, just that at the back of his mind or her mind, the decision maker has this little red arrow saying, you know, look, I, I've done a bit of, you know, I ha have a model and I've thought about this a bit, but yeah, there might be something I haven't thought about. And that goes off in this direction. And as I say, I'm going to have the heuristic, uh, you know, if I think about you know, coming to Berkeley, for example, there are lots of things I haven't thought about, but I sort of think, well, probably a lot of those things are going to be fun. Um, but if I think about releasing a chemical into the, in the environment, mostly I think about things that aren't going to be, the things that I haven't thought about aren't going to be fun things. So, so I'll use my red colour to, to indicate that. Uh, and so then the question is, well, but what can you do with this? Well, as I said, my imaginary Bayesian is going to say, well, just think harder. If you think harder, you'll be able to fill in the decision tree with some probabilities in there and yeah, then you go ahead and do your analysis. So I, I, I'm going to say though that that isn't, uh, that isn't possible and so we have to find some alternative. So I've said unfavourable surprise. So I'm going to define this a bit formally. Crucially, and, and this is very important in terms, of, in terms of when we talk about the precautionary principle and the risk that we'll end up paralysed, if we're going to apply this, we have to have a status quo strategy that yields zero. Whatever zero, whatever zero may be, to say I'm going to ha you know, do something that has an unfavourable surprise is something worse than I could have got by, by playing safety first, whatever that might be. Uh, so the strategy is subject to unfavourable surprise if I can get zero for sure, but the alternative, but if I play this strategy, nature might move in such a way that I get something less, and I haven't considered it. So. Uh, Strong form of the precautionary principle is the heuristic constraint that says exclude strategies subject to unfavourable surprises. And here we run into our first difficulty. That seems like a reasonable story, but we immediately see we don't approve because we know if we approve that something bad might, ha something bad might happen to us. But it's also true that we don't study because one possible outcome of the study is we find something that leads us to abandon the project, we've spent the money on the study, we could have had zero, we end up with minus C. So that immediately, I think, encapsulates why it is that, uh, yeah, why it is the precautionary principle is so problematic that a reasonably appealing looking version of it instantly leads you to, to an ultra conservative viewpoint, even with regard to, uh, even with regard to uh, uh, sensible sounding strategies like uh, putting a bit more study before you move. Uh, you know, I'm going to eschew ad hoc things of saying I'm going to, yeah, of making some special status for the study type action and just say that uh, yeah, that seems to, be, um, seems to be excessively strong. So here's the, the principle and we just, we can just see the numbers here and see that um, all of these, um, I'm going to um, assume that uh, if you, uh, let's see, so here's the precaution principle, we're going to rule out, approve and study because both of them on this upper tree uh, potentially can make us worse off than worse off than zero. So, let's see if we can modify the precautionary principle a bit. So, I started with nothing at all about my upper red arrow, but that, that's and obviously what that says is, if you have no, nothing at all, you really are you really end up paralysed into extreme conservatism. Let's suppose now that first that I don't have a fully specified probability distribution, but I nonetheless have at least a more likely than not. Um, kind of characteristic, that I've done you know, some analysis of my problem, I think it's more, more likely than not that my analysis is the right analysis and that um, you know, the unconsidered probabilities are, are at least less likely than the ones I've already considered. Uh, probably if we're not in that situation then indeed the strong precautionary principle doesn't sound like such a bad idea. If, if we really think we've thought about it but we're still almost certainly wrong, then maybe we should be being conservative. Uh, and we're also going to assume that, uh, oh, this C is, um, yeah, I've managed to reuse the same notation, uh, but I'm going to think that, um, well, the C is the right one here. It's, it's the, um, uh, it's going to, um, it's going, yeah, it, it's the cost of um, uh, 
the cost of the, lo the, the cost of the surprise, which is, is appropriate for the um, appropriate for the study strategy. The, the worst case I get is I've wasted my money on the study. If the expect if I say that it's more likely than not that the study is going to confirm my uh, prior beliefs and the benefit of going ahead is greater than the cost of the study, then without a fully specified uh, model, I can nonetheless say, okay, then uh, it seems reasonable to go ahead with the study and see what comes out. Uh, and so uh, the principle in this case says uh, uh, the modified pre uh, precautionary principle allows study, but still excludes approve. That is, still excludes uh, the option of going ahead and approving the project without, uh, without study. So I've just put in a yellow here to say this is, yeah, this is the, the amber state in my story. This is the state that you, you would reject on the case of the uh, strong precautionary principle, but approve uh, in the case of the uh, modified precautionary principle. So I'll just, I'll just briefly stop now and, and say yeah, all, all, of the, um, all of the reasoning here, I've given the informal exposition of it. The, the paper with Simon Grant, which I think is, is now on the website, has uh, an extensive modological description of, of the kind of propositional uh, reasoning you need to justify this and how it ties back to a, high, ties back to a hierarchy of state spaces in terms of the literature un unawareness. I thought in the time available it wasn't worth um, are going over that, but for, but for those in the audience who, who do, I, you know, I'm really pleased with this work, so I'd be very grateful if, if uh, anybody wants to take a look at it and find, uh, uh, find uh, particularly problems with it. What I want to now talk about, I think, which is something that's been missed in most of the precautionary principle literature, is that we're typically talking about interactive decisions. And you know, this is something I really, in terms of working on awareness, really had to be pushed into. I didn't want to tackle the interactive case. Um, you know, when, when we are aware that other people are unaware, uh, all sorts of nasty complexities arise, but eventually decided it couldn't be dodged. And, um, and actually it's really, it turns out I think to be really helpful in understanding the precautionary principle. That it's actually much more compelling as a rule for collective decisions uh, and, and complex collective decisions, not merely aggregating opinions, but different players playing different roles. Uh, than it is as a principle for individual decisions. When I think it is, it still has force, but I think it works even better in this case. So now I'm going to have two players, a proponent and a regulator. Uh, proponent chooses a study or no study, and then uh, the regulator chooses approve or reject. And I'm going to assume that the proponent always gets, uh, bears the cost of the study, always gets the benefit of the project. Uh, uh, the regulator is uh, socially concerned and looks in addition at the you know, the costs are borne by society and the regulator is in the business of regulating because they want to stop projects that cause large scale social damage. Uh, they're not, so, you know, they, they're the proponent, the regulator is a you know, social planner, so they, they care about the proponent's benefits, but they also care about the, um, uh, they also care about uh, society as a whole. So the regulator's desire would be to get the projects approved in the case when it was, um, in case when, uh, when expected damage was moderate. Uh, rejected when expected damage was severe. Uh, so in the absence of study, neither, neither player is aware of the possible adverse move by nature. And the players may be either naive, that is they, they've got their model and they think it's the right model, or they can be conscious of their own unawareness. Uh, so here's just the, just the picture. We've now got three players and so um, uh, I've just, I, uh, you know, the nature's move, nature, I've left nature's move um, uh, here, uh, so the, it's the, um, uh, uh, the proponent moves on the study. Here's nature's moves, which I'll put, down, put, put later. Since they're un unobserved, that doesn't matter. Uh, and then the regulator, decides at the, the regulator decides whether to approve or reject. If the project's approved, nature gets another move to decide whether the hazard is realised or not. So equilibrium for naive players. No study or approve is dominant. Both players accept the simple model where there is only the... Um, where there's only the, uh, the moderate risk. So the proponent sees no point in studying, in, in undertaking a study. The regulator goes ahead and approves. And I think you know, that's typically the equilibrium of most of the models of unawareness that's out there in the, liter out there in the literature. That is, they don't, you know, they show that you can get an equilibrium uh, with unawareness in a, in a standard game. And basically you prune the, you prune the trees and stop at that. If you, want, if you are aware of unawareness, that's represented not by a different meta reasoning principle, but by simply adding some, adding some extra nodes in the tree, which are supposed to represent your unawareness. I, I don't regard that as a satisfactory 
way of tackling things at all, but, but that's, one, that, that's one way of sticking to the standard framework, that you just say, if I'm, I'm aware of the things I'm unaware of, I'll just put them back in uh, and go back to being a good Bayesian. Um, so what about uh, naive regulator and sophisticated proponent? Well, the proponent, in this case, um, we've, this is the first case where we get some strategic action in the story. Uh, the proponent knows that if they, don't, if they don't undertake a study, the regulators go and go ahead and approve. If they do undertake the study, uh, they're already aware or conscious of the fact that something bad might turn up. Uh, this is certainly, I think, a pretty significant uh, real life possibility. Uh, and indeed, of course, you know, that is that um, uh, sensible proponents, uh, or at least sensible within a certain time frame, have been found ex post to have engaged in a lot of behaviour designed to ensure that they don't discover anything that might cause trouble. Uh, in the longer run, they, some of those proponents haven't considered the possibility that uh, uh, their internal memos will get uh, plastered all over the internet and that, um, that, uh, that their internal strategy might not be so effective. But at, at this level of the game, they certainly have acted in a sophisticated fashion. So um, equilibrium for sophisticated players is straightforwardly, again, now everybody is, is thinking in this way. So if, if the proponent undertakes no study, the um, uh, the uh, uh, regulator will reject, uh, therefore the proponent undertakes study and now the job of the regulator is easy. Uh, they either they approve if the study comes out well and reject if it comes out badly. The case I have most trouble with is that of a naive proponent who just thinks all oh, this is a load of nonsense, they've got their project, they're going to go ahead with it, but a sophisticated regulator. So I'm going to, um, at this point I really need to get some good game theory advice on what I'm assuming here, but essentially I'm going to assume that Although the proponent has no idea why it is the regulator is going to re reject the proposal with, without a study, uh, in equilibrium, they don't. You know, they, their anticipation is correct. That the um, they correctly anticipate that the uh, regulator is going to reject unless there's a study. So they undertake this study, which from their point of view is a waste of time, and um, then then the regulator proceeds to uh, approve if the study comes out right, reject if they don't. So, uh, what exactly? You know, that case I think is is a little more complex in terms, of, in terms of exactly what equilibrium notion we're using, uh, given this limited awareness. Um, so what this says is, whereas everything else previously has said, roughly speaking, the precautionary principle is a decision theory. It's a way of adjusting the standard decision theory in order to give you, um, in order to give you outcomes that seem more reasonable. Uh, I would argue, yeah, and that, that's, well, that's the way all of, all of us, decision theorists anyway, have thought about it. I would argue for something that's a bit more like the way, you know, the, way the lawyer said in particular, as a procedural rule. It, is, it isn't saying, here's something you need to stick in to make the utility calculation come out right. Uh, it's something, it's a constraint, like the general savage small world story that says we, apply, we first isolate a small part of the world and then apply risk analysis to that. This says, um, uh, we also want to constrain our set of actions to say some actions uh, that seem to us to expose us to um, expose us to risk we haven't fully understood. We're just going to rule those actions out of consideration on a procedural basis, then proceed to apply uh, a formal analysis. Um, so in individual, in individual decisions, it's a heuristic about unknown unknowns and unfavourable surprises. And I'll give my favourite view on this point now that you know, Donald Rumsfeld got in a lot of trouble when he talked about unknown unknowns. Uh, but you know, the point he was making, grammatically and in decision theoretic terms, was absolutely right. The only point I'd make is, if I was a sophisticated thinker about unknown unknowns, I wouldn't send 100,000 troops into a country that was full of them. And uh, that sort of, uh, uh, you know, it, it did seem that, uh, having said this, he seemed very surprised when some of these unknown unknowns started popping up. But, um, uh, but that's, that's the individual, um, that's the individual decision. In joint decisions, I think more appealingly, uh, where we certainly can't assume a unified rational decision maker, it plays a burden of proof on the proponent to say, satisfy me that there aren't any unknown unknowns to within some, some reasonable degree of certainty, say the degree of certainty associated with the status quo option. If you can satisfy me of that, I will proceed to evaluate your proposal. Otherwise, it falls at the first hurdle. So what are the implications for climate change? Well, first up, there's no perfectly safe action, and that's, that's, that's important. Um, and um, 
yeah, so we, so we need, yeah, that, that certainly suggests that we don't want to try strong versions of the precautionary principle because they're just going to give us null advice saying, you know, uh, in particular, if we think about your, your typical story of per, per, perfectly safe action, it would be business as usual. Yeah, that in a, in a generic context, business as usual is what you'd expect to be the action recommended by an advocate of the precautionary principle. Of course, in this case, it's precisely the one that we want to, um, uh, that we know is not, uh, is not safe and sustainable. But um, losses from early mitigation can be bounded by economic analysis. Uh, we, can, you know, we can just do a back of the envelope exercise that says, suppose we simply replicated the existing energy supply using some essentially infinite source like solar that costs four times as much as, as, uh, as the existing source. That gives us a GDP number, something like 20% of GDP. I mean, ludicrously too high, but enough to, enough to put a bound on our losses. Um, and so we can, uh, we, yeah, we can tight, if we need to, we can tighten that bound, de bound down a bit. The worst that can happen is that we spend a bunch of money, a, a finite bunch of money that, that we didn't really need to. By contrast, as we've heard alarmingly this morning, uh, potentially unbounded losses from, from business as usual. Uh, so the modified PP certainly supports early mitigation in some form over business as usual. Uh, as I say, again, the strong form doesn't help us, but the modified precautionary principle does help us. Much trickier, how much mitigation? So um, I think yeah, you can, with a sufficiently pessimistic view, you can push yourself all the way back to an almost instantaneous cessation of emissions with the aim of getting us back to 278 or whatever the pre-industrial climate is as fast as possible. Uh, that, that's one that, yeah, unlike what I said previously, is very difficult to bound below in terms of the, in terms of the economic cost. That is, when I said early mitigation can be bounded below, uh, we still have to take the time it takes to replace all our existing, uh, all our existing capital stock, which is, is at least 10 or 20 years. So um, uh, what's on the table as something that, that's plausible and therefore in political terms something we ought to get behind unless we're convinced that there is a really fundamental problem with it, which is, is being debated at present, is a 450 parts per million target. I'll argue that if we hypothesise, as economists are want to do, that uh, we have a backstop option of, that will allow us to pull, out, pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at a cost of something like $200 a tonne later in the century. That precludes a bunch of the longer term feedbacks, you know, the, the ice sheets melting and things like that, that we would be worried about if we sustained temperatures above two degrees, two degrees above pre-industrial for a long period. That gives you the kind of, you know, that's, you know, I'm, I won't defend that as a factual claim, I'm just saying if, if you're willing to buy those assumptions, then you can make a precautionary a case for the precautionary principle that says something like a 450 parts per million slash two degrees target uh, makes reasonable sense as a, as a, a policy framework for the next uh, 20 or 30 years uh, with the proviso that uh, we have to assume that, that uh, we can deal with a fat tail sometime in the second half of this century. If you buy those things, then you get at least a coherent policy conclusion. So that's... Uh, that's the end of the uh, end of the talk, and I guess uh, we can open up. Thank you, <laughs> Marcella Fulvio. Do you also want to come to the front, or and if you have any immediate comments, you're the first one to comment, <laughs> and otherwise we take general questions from the audience. Do you wanted to say anything first? Particularly, or on it? No. Okay. Then we take we take questions, please. So let me go ahead with the first one. If you uh, have this uh, mixture between the standard expected utility and kind of the arrow Hurwitz criteria, where you have uh, the best and the worst outcome, and if we think about how to apply that in climate change. How would you apply it in terms of the best and the worst outcome, which is really difficult, like, like where you put the best, where you put the worst outcome. And in the particular decision criteria, it actually gets a lot of weight, right, unless we go to the expected value criterion. Do you have any idea? Um, well, I have an answer, perhaps a kind of unsatisfactory answer for this question, which is um, to some specific problems, it is quite easy to, um, to make... Um, uh, these sort of applications. 
Um, it, uh, for instance, um, if you think about some problem of um, adaptation, uh, I have a, a recent paper on um, a specific device that has been set to protect the Venice Lagoon from the rise in, uh, in the, uh, the sea. This is called Mose. And in that case, it's quite easy because what you really need to apply these, you, know, you need to have a list of consequences. And you need to, um, and the decision maker need to be able to, to make this list so it needs to be aware <laughs> and we we have seen that this is not always the case and need to be able to rank them if you do that then it's quite easy to um to apply it and what is interesting that you can do and this is something also that i might suggest to the to the audience is that you can also do the exercise the other way around that is uh, once uh, uh, the, 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 the project has been set and then is going to be implemented somehow, or for instance, once the target has been identified, you know, certain target in terms of CO2 emission, what does that mean in terms of the ambiguity attitude that the disease the maker has had in mind once he took this decision? What does this mean in terms of the, um, uh, the weighting between the consequences that it has taken even implicitly, perhaps, um, once it has taken this, this decision. This is something that we also uh, we can also do, and we can also derive the the figures. And and of course, in the case of uh, I was just mentioning, it turns out that the uh, the ambiguity attitude has had in mind has been a rather pessimistic one, uh, overweighting the worst consequences, which is, I believe, um, the the ambiguity attitude that almost all um, climate change decision um, that we have already implemented or that, that has already been taken uh, have had uh, in mind uh, according to, um, to the principle that has been followed. But of course, with more general problems, you need to be able to, to be aware that is to, to, to rank all the consequences. If you can't, Well, just to comment briefly, I mean, I mean, the, the worst outcome is hard, but the best outcome is easy, namely either the scientists turn out to have got it completely wrong or, you know, a magic, uh, magic broom comes along and the favoured one in Australia is carbon capture and sequestration. Basically, if you had a cheap technology for that, we could just go ahead, just stick, you know, stick the, the sucker on the top of the pipe, uh, pump, it, pump it away underground and, and the whole problem goes away. And so, and I think it's fair to say as an observation, that excessive weight has been faced on that probability in terms of the decision making of uh, <coughs> of governments in general. There's a lot of yeah, a lot of weight placed on the hope that the whole problem will go away if we we close our eyes, and I would say probably more weight than that than the than the positive probability of that event justifies. Um, I think also that um, sometimes it is. Um is uh, not a true question because we have a clear idea of, uh, about uh, the worst consequences and that we have to remember that we are not able to evaluate correctly by uh, an approach based on a utility when you multiply uh, very, very low probability with very, very large consequences. Mm -hmm. So we have an idea, for example, of the consequences. In the case of a Katrina, uh, they have to decide if to apply uh, the cost plan uh, 2050 uh, or not. And they decide they have a cost uh, uh, 16 billion of dollars or not. In the case of pandemic flu, they have to decide if, if uh, to buy antiviral and they, uh, they have a price uh, 23 euros uh, for a, a one shot or not. Is it clear? Even if you are not so precise about uh, the evaluation of a consequence, you have a, an idea, and then you, you can able to rank uh, the outcomes. This is enough, in my view. So can I comment on this point? So there's a lot of talk about ambiguity and imprecision with regard to the probabilities. But in fact, there's also an equal amount of imprecision about the outcomes. So I think it's in some sense, I mean, you are right that if you know that a shot costs $23, that, but I think that's the exception, because usually it's very hard to quantify what is the worst and the best outcome. And it's surprising to me that ma most of the models tend to treat this as precise and focus only on one of the sources of imprecision. It's a question of a cost-benefit analysis. Also, Professor Quiggin explained in a lot of paper. It's the same story about uh, the discount rate. It's a different story, but very, very close. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, the, the only, yes, you can be so precise. Uh, you, you can be able to have the right uh, uh, distribution of the li right evaluation. But uh, if you have, in the case of a pandemic, if you have uh, three uh, out of cent probability, uh, 100 probability to have a pandemic, you have to decide to buy or not to buy. This is a, a, a choice that you have evaluated on the base on the cost-benefit analysis. And what is the consequence if you don't buy? I think another reason for this in economics is the general belief that for most of the problems we're talking about, we can reduce the consequences to a monetary sum. We've got a whole bunch of tools for doing that. So in that sense, we know what the outcome space is. And so we can, if you, if you buy that, which you know, obviously economists are much more likely to buy than other people, then all your uncertainty is about the about the probability distribution, which is the states and yeah, the, st the states of nature and the causal relations. So that's that's I think one reason why economists tend not to worry very much about, uh, in a formal sense, about out, un about the imprecision with which the outcome space is defined, is the assumption that we can price all that out using the tools we already have. Um, I like both papers, but I was very taken, John, with your uh, discussion of the incompleteness hypothesis. Um, and uh, so you give the example of the, Ra of the Rasmussen report uh, mm. looking at the probability of a you know, nuclear accident. Yeah. And um, uh, then we had Three Mile Island, and the sort of actual empirical probability was whatever, 100 yeah. times more. But you see, it came about in a way because of pathways which nobody anticipated. And so the problem is if, if I were trying to have multiple priors and, and so on, I would never in a thousand years have come up with, a, in this case, a sufficiently high probability of a pathway because I, I, uh, it, that never occurred to me. And let me give you the example with Katrina. Um, when uh, Katrina, uh, when the Katrina occurred, the New Orleans flood defense system, which was supposed to have been completed by 1980, was not complete. It was due for completion in 2013. Uh, but in 2005, parts of it uh, were complete, 90% uh, complete, 95% complete, even 99% complete. It was those parts where 25 of the 26 levee failures occurred. Uh, the breaches, as I say, 25 out of 26 failures occurred in the parts which were over 90% complete, as opposed to the parts. Which, and I, I take it as being analogous to the Three Mile Island. Uh, and you know, there were, there were things, of, of course, ex post. Um, there were things wrong with the levees and, and the way they were maintained and, and, and so on, which made, meant they didn't work as, as, as planned. But so to me, the pervasive problem is the pathways you, you don't anticipate. And because you don't anticipate them, it's, it's very hard, it's very artificial to say, well, just give me a sort of pessimistic uh, uh, probability. So that raises the question. You said the uh, precautionary principle is a procedural rule, and, mm -hmm. and you give, I think, a very nice explanation for it, a way of thinking about it, not a decision rule. Um, so the $64,000 question is, so what is a decision rule? when there are um, these sort of uh, pathways that you, you didn't an anticipate. And so you kind of can't build priors around them in, um, you, you don't know how to build pri uh, priors around them. And I know there are models which sort of work on, on direct, the, the representation of the state space itself. Has been. Mm -hmm. So this is a question sort of to sure. the panel, but also to the theorists. You know, is this, what does one do if one feels worried that one doesn't know the pathways? So uh, yeah. one doesn't know. So just in case there's anyone here who hasn't read all the papers on the website, um, since I didn't refer to it, um, it, I was referring to I mentioned the Rasmussen report, which was an attempt to study in advance the risks of a nuclear accident. And what they did, in essence, was to think of every possible nuclear accident that could happen, evaluate the probabilities according to paths, and they came up with a conclusion like one in 100 million reactor years and published this in 1975 to great acclamation. And of course, two years later, uh, the Three Mile Island meltdown took place. Uh, with a sort of path that was kind of similar to the ones that they thought about, but not one that, not one they'd imagined. And so the question is, well, how, how do you handle something like this? And so I suppose 
yeah, if I push my own thing now, I say, well, yeah, we could do the Rasmussen report. Then we could say, take, take a solar installation in the desert, and we could do something similar. And then we'd ask, well, which is more likely that something, you know, that we've missed out something in our solar story that's going to cause it to catastrophically melt down and you know, kill thousands of people in surrounding areas, or that we've left out something in, in the nuclear plant. And it seems to me you don't need a fully specified model to think, well, it's a much, much more likely that something's going to go badly wrong trying to confine a nuclear reaction within a concrete chamber than it is setting up a bunch of pan panels out in the desert somewhere. And so my conclusion would be that if we had thought carefully about the, um, if we thought carefully about nuclear power at the time of the Ras Rasmussen report, we would have reached the policy conclusion which we did reach in the wake of Three Mile Island, in effect, which is in a current state of nuclear technology, we shouldn't be doing this. That's, that was effectively what the market came up with in response to, to nuclear power, was just say, yeah, we can analyse the risk, but we simply can't get a good enough handle on it to do that. And then you could say, well, we're trying again, and at least, do it, at least people are doing things, broadly speaking, in the right way. That is, they're not saying, let's close off yeah, for every possible thing that can happen. We'll have a, an alarm and an operator paid to watch that alarm, uh, a la The Simpsons. And, uh, and as long as uh, everything goes well, there won't be an accident. They say, we're going to produce something which has very few alarms, very few controls, lots of built-in uh, redundant, lots of built-in feedbacks which ensure that, the, that uh, ensure that the system can't get out of control. Perhaps, I mean, I haven't looked, perhaps they can reach the point of saying, yeah, we're now convinced that, you know, to the same level as at least, say, a coal plant or something like that, we've convinced ourselves that the risk of something going badly wrong has been has been measured. That 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 would have been the correct approach, not the Rasmussen approach, and so that's the conclusion I get. And I guess similarly with levy banks, I yeah, you, know, you would start with the proposition: if you're going to build a major city below sea level in an area prone to hurricanes, um, you know, how likely is it that you know, uh, when something happens differently to what you expected, uh, you know, the results are going to be pleasant? I would say very unlikely, and therefore you would build in lots of redundancy. Yeah, you, you, would, you would want to have a, a system which was massively more, uh, yeah, massively more robust than, than your analysis would project. And of course, yeah, routine engineering practice is calculate what you need according to standard theory and then double it or, or something of that kind. That's, uh, yeah, so I, th I think yeah, in broad terms, I think the story can, the story does certainly fits the Rasmussen report and I think could, be, yeah, could fit Katrina reasonably well. <clears throat> so since we've been uh, uh, asked to say something about, uh, actually this is uh, related to the issue about, you know, um, poor description of consequences and so on. It's, it's been, it's one of these uh, kind of uh, folk results in the literature on ambiguity that you can uh, interpret um, ambiguity is really as a reduced form for a situation yeah. where unawareness is really the what is going on, and uh, uh, you know, ever since basically ever since Arthur Dempster's original uh, contributions, and uh, the two of us have actually uh, written uh, job market papers on this. Um, the 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 interesting thing is, you know. Well, first of all, yes, uh, you know, we tend to concentrate uh, on uh, under description of a state space, but there are other phenomena which are uh, equally lo uh, plausible and, uh, and not as uh, well understood, like, for instance, under description of consequences, and this was uh, already uh, mentioned. In fact, uh, recently, I know that there is a, a couple of guys who are doing some uh, experiments on a variant of the Ellsberg paradox where what is uh, you know, in some experiment, in you know, in some choices, what is under described is actually consequences rather than mm -hmm. rather than states. Oh, you have done to okay. So I I have to I have to create a, a communication between you and those guys, um, and and it turns out that the results are different than what you observe in the Esper paradox, or at least uh, that's what they found. Um, so you know, so there is. Even though the theorists would be tempted to say, well, it's the same thing, turns out maybe not. And, and also, one more thing, uh, which I think relates to the idea of past and so on. If we, if we start, I mean, 
you know, if we take seriously what uh, Jimmy Savage told us about, uh, Jimmy Savage and, and Game Theory told us about, you know, reducing dynamic decision problems to static problems and so on, then you immediately realize that saying that there is a possibility that the state space is underspecified is equivalent to saying that your strategy yeah. space is underspecified. Yeah. There is no reason why you should be not understanding the state space, but understanding perfectly your strategy space, right? I mean, if you're going to play chess, uh, against uh, uh, a grandmaster, the point is, uh, you know, what the mm. guy knows better than you is actually how his strategy mm. space is uh, better specified. Um, so these, uh, <coughs> so these are all things that are basically, you know, boiled down to more or less the same kind of phenomena as he was describing. Uh, and in the, uh, well, if I can advertise, I'm, I'm actually I'm I'm doing work with a, a colleague at the Collegio Calalberto in this area, and of course, uh, then uh, there is other work that has been done previously. Yeah, I should say that the, the formal model we have, you know, what you're unaware of is histories, which are both, yeah, which, which, yeah, so you're unaware of both elements of the, con each history has a consequence attached to it. So, so in that sense, we, because it's, because we do it, do a dynamic representation with changing awareness over time. You know, the motive was to get changing awareness over time, but it also means that the state consequence decision really disappears in, in that dynamic setup. So, um, I'll, I'll unanswer it from a sort of an applications point of view and, and say that um, I think the question's misspecified, um, which actually in, in a way comes back to what, what, what Pella said, um, that I, I think it's pretty hard to find a disaster or some fabulous opportunity that someone someplace didn't predict. Mm. Um, and um, the, the real question then is how do you get uh, an individual or more appropriately an organization to pay appropriate attention to things outside their current planning mode? And so, you know, it's not surprising that you had a bunch of nuclear experts. What's the probability that the system's going to fail and they come up with a very low number? Um, if you you know, but people employ red teaming all the time, and you ask a different question, you say, come up with, you know, paths that this can fail, and people are pretty good at doing that. And then the question is, how do you get the institution to accept that information, which is your point about the unknown unknowns and mm -hmm. the Rumsfeld situation. Um, and how do you, you know, which, which is both giving it an op option so it can deal with that information, and then in, uh, you know, in, in, in many contexts, uh, putting that organization in an environment where it can, in fact, say we haven't hedged against all the risks because some of the risks aren't worth hedging against, um, which is often a difficult thing for an agency and a, uh, either a private or public entity to do in, in, in our society. So I, I, I was interested because what, what you're both telling me is the strategy space is uh, mm -hmm. under specified, and 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 the point is in an organisation often, or, or uh, when you have a decision maker, um, the decision maker may see a choice set, which is limited. It's limited to what he's yeah. used to, or what they've always yeah. done, or whatever. And so it's a mistake to think that there's sort of a you know an immense mm -hmm. choice set. Uh, that, that there's the complete choice set. And so I take it that what's going on or, or the need is to get, or the difficulty is to get the decision maker to broaden the strategy set, to broaden the choice set of, of actions. And, and that may be the weak link. Concerning the first talk, Marcelo, could you explain again why one should be pessimistic with respect to losses and optimistic with respect to gains? Well, um, why not? <laughs> um, no, I mean, um, you, can, you can elaborate the theory uh, adopting this approach or its opposite. Um, actually, we have done both. And the, you have some interesting representation of both cases. Um, but what Marcello showed is that um, it is actually, uh, so the answer is, first of all, because it is conceivable. Second point, because um, in some case, that's the case, that, that's what happened. Um, um, now I understand that the you know uh, the, the story the story that Ellisberg report 
it's a story of someone who has taken a decision being uh, pessimistic on the um, worst consequences, pes pessimistic on the catastrophic losses. Uh, now, the, the, I, I suppose that your question is, why is it that you should be at the same time pessimistic on catastrophic losses and, and optimistic on gains? Ha, that's, um, that's a hard question, but nevertheless, um, I think that I that's a situation that is conceivable, okay? Uh, so you might want to have a presentation on what happens in case that's the case, which does, in case that's the, the all possible case, you know, the, the case of uh, the all possible story, then you need not to be exactly optimistic on gains, in which case you just, you know, turn off that outcome. Well, what you really need is a, is, is a functional that encompasses all the outcomes, wow, how, the way we've seen it. Then in case you believe that the decision maker you, you, are, such a, you are advising or whoever uh, is not exactly like that, you just turn off that. Or if he's not, turn off the other point. But what you really want is a general description of the problem. And um, uh, um, I do believe that, I mean, this is like, you know, cheap talk, but I do believe that uh, we are all uh, optimistic on uh, um, windfall gains when we take decisions. Like, for instance, I don't know if you participate to, um, how you say, you know, the, the polls, the lotteries. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, whenever I buy, uh, you know, a Christmas ticket lottery, basically I am optimistic on windfall gain. Because, and uh, of course, you know, you know, the expected utility theory says that, you know, you should never expect to win and I don't win. Uh, so, I mean, you, you, to be a bit more precise, you want to have a theory that tells you, look, in case the decision maker has these attitudes, that's what happens. If he it, if it doesn't have it, you just turn off that outcome. Just an observation. I mean, if you strip out the, um, the reference point effects in cumulative prospect theory, so you just, you just I mean, in the Carmen and Tversky thing, if you're always in the domain of gains, which is, is broadly plausible for, for climate change, that across a wide range of outcomes, we're still better off in 2050. It's only a question of how much better off than now. And in that version, the standard prospect theory has uh, overweighting of both gains, and, uh, extreme gains and extreme, sorry, overweighting the extreme upper and lower tails of the distribution. So as long as you're working with it, as long as you, you're not affected by reference point effects, that's, yeah, that also drops out that way. Let me just say my own work on impacts. So this is not the question of mitigation and, yeah. and will we be richer in 2050 yeah. and so on, which is right, but looking at sort of impacts from um, reductions in water supply yeah. or increased uh, wildfire or, or crop losses. Uh, I think downside loss is very important, or some yeah. sort of asymmetry yeah. with a with a reference point, which is not necessarily a loss, but it's yeah. you know worse uh, this sort of customary experience, and 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 then there's uh, there's worse than that, uh, and so I think as a description of how decision makers, water managers, or or, or you know, city planners, or whatever, see things, uh, the downside loss is is. Yeah. Um, characterizes, you know, captures what they see. And, and uh, also I found in some of the simulations we've done, uh, climate simulations affecting California water supply, um, at least, uh, so the way it turns out, there's actually not much change in the variance, say, of water deliveries to agriculture. But there's a huge uh, change in the semi-variance. That is, mm -hmm. there's a huge shift of mass to the sort of bad outcomes with a, a, a minor change in variance. And so it sort of makes a, a difference whether you, you think of risk or whether you think of downside mm. risk because this is almost you know, a minimal increase in risk but a huge increase mm. in downside risk. And then the, and the other side may be also that there is an overweighting of sort of extreme good outcomes mm. because people, they're, they're more salient for people. Mm. And it may be the sort of outcomes that, that, that are more familiar that are that are likely to occur one way or the other, but but that um, are less salient. So I think, in, in sort of as a description of how decision makers may see things and how they may uh, feel about things and also how they may exaggerate things, it's uh, realistic in quite a number of cases. Uh, if I can add one, just one thing, then sorry. Uh, 
I also like to see the, the result of um, the, the paper Marcello has shown uh, the other way around. That is to say, if we believe that it is interesting, the representation we have seen, that is uh, a weighting of the expected utility and the um, max min and max max, the, uh, and if you talk about these without you know, the theoretical structure, that seems like a kind of intuitive way of representing uh, the weak form of the precautionary principle. Mm -hmm. Then what the paper shows is that if that is intuitive and you like it, that means that it is as if the decision maker has an attitude for, for which he, has, he must be pessimistic on losses and optimistic on gains, and has a familiar set, not a familiar point, but a familiar set, some set of which he has more competence or whatever, and he believes as a familiar. So if you think it the other way around, it also provides you, you know, it tells you something about what is in mind of the decision maker if the, the, the rule that he follows has that structure. If we consider not only a reference point, such as in the original version of uh, cumulative prospect theory, but an interval, such as uh, not only in our paper, but also in Koseiji or Sadgen and Starmer, and you have uh, the third the generation of uh, prospect theory, you can explain also reversal of preferences, for example. And uh, because uh, you are a sort of improvement, if you, int you introduce this approach in finance, you can you can fit better some behavior, uh, such as an uh, equity premium puzzle, for example. And um, uh, we, we think that it could be a way to, to represent uh, a new proce procedural uh, rule for a precautionary principle, for example. And uh, you, you have also to consider that the decision maker has a particular role, the president of the United States, for example, or the president, and uh, you have to this fact modifies the attitude with respect to ambiguity that is subjective. And so what uh, Ellisberg says uh, in, uh, in his uh, dissertation was that uh, there is a confidence, but there is also some part related to your role in the, in the social life that is relevant for the definition of your attitude with respect to extreme event. Because what is not clear is how uh, do you consider extreme event, your attitude with respect to extreme events. Just a small question about, say, the precautionary principle and, and coming back to all the dynamics again, because we talked a bit about it in the previous session with Sudor's paper. Uh, so normally you would expect, I mean, there's this debate, you should have this policy ramp at a quantity of telling rule, you should ever, ever higher, higher increasing uh, pollution taxes or whatever, or should you have a very, very vigorous and um, ambitious environmental policy now according to the precautionary principle. But then presumably every time you're going to have pleasant surprises because the precautionary principle means you assume things are going to be worse than you thought and then you're going to be pleasantly surprised. That's in the nature of enforcing the precautionary principle. So are there any models who've done this precautionary principle in the dynamic climate change models and that then would then the optimal thing that the optimal taxes or the optimal price of permits would actually go down over time rather than this policy ramp or, <laughs> I mean, so, 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 so uh, 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 another way of putting it, asking experts on both sides of the table, uh, which techniques should I use to, do, to address this stuff properly dynamically in a, in a proper dynamic context? Because the issue is inherently dynamic. Certainly, I would say the precautionary principle compared to, say, the kind of stuff that comes out of dice suggests that you should have an initially higher, uh, you should have an initially higher uh, price uh, than than you know, than dice suggests. And I guess what that says is, if, uh, well, I wouldn't quite say you're pleasantly surprised. If there are no if there are no surprises, then you end up uh, you end up flattening out, you know, having a low, lower rate of increase, and perhaps ultimately falling below the the trajectory that the, the dice model would have, would have suggested. So, I, I mean, that's off the top of my head, but that's, that's the way I would see it, is you start out with higher prices. If it turns out that, that everything important was already in dice, then you end up having done too much mitigation early, so you do less mitigation later, and so the two paths cross over, and then there's a bit of a welfare loss. Yeah, and, 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 and there's an intertemporal welfare loss from the fact that you, d you deviated from the optimal path, but that's relatively small, and you've protected yourself against the surprises. So. 
that's absolutely off the top of my head, but that's the way I would I would read it. M might mean that if you're doing a really tough environmental policy, but basically scaring the people and making things worse worse off, and then in the end things don't turn out as bad as you promised them. I mean, I mean, just trying to that might it then undermine the support for your environmental policy in later periods, or you, you, kind of depends on how you frame it. Mm. Yeah, 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 exactly. Framing yeah. issue there. Yeah. <laughs> And so certainly, I mean, clearly a lot of the opposition on climate change is based on an in that interpretation of, of past events, although, I mean, many of the people who put this are equally scathing about successful interventions like uh, CFCs and the ozone layer saying, oh, that doesn't seem to be such a problem anymore. So uh, it's hard to, tell, hard to tell whether some groups could be re reached in any way, but certainly there's yeah, a feeling that that's the severity of problems has been overstated in the past and therefore will turn out to be overstated in the future.